This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Indocana Health. What if you had such a clear understanding of your own DNA and genetic makeup that you could make informed decisions about what type of cannabis products interact best with your system? Well, now you can with EndoDNA. EndoDNA is a simple DNA test that maps your entire endocannabinoid system and then matches that summary with the specific cannabinoid ratio and terpene profile that's aligned with your unique genotype. Imagine being armed with personal information when visiting a dispensary. You'll have the knowledge and capability to to purchase products that best aligns with your genotype. Visit their website to purchase the EndoDNA Collection Kit and Endo Decoded Report at endodna.com products and use the promo code CONNECT15 for a 20% discount. Again, that website is endodna.com products and you use the promo code CONNECT15 for a 20% discount. The future of cannabinoid therapeutics is here with EndoDNA. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Stuart Tom. He's the Vice President of Human Nutrition at CV Sciences. Stuart Tom, how are you, sir? Kevin, I've never had a bad day in my life. Thank you for having me on your show. You know what? I've heard you say that before on other podcasts. And I got to tell you, man, I love the positive energy and outlook. I think you even said that during a podcast in quarantine, like at the height of the pandemic. So you truly live a positive life, my friend. Thank you very much. I'm so lucky. I was lucky to have been exposed to the natural product industry very young and then be obviously exposed to the plant to cannabis and hemp and so the combination of those things and sort of the wellness tract that every human being seems to be on prevention 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 people have never been more interested in their mental and physical health so it's really a great time to be alive and a good time to be part of the community yeah, I can totally agree and relate to you on that. Like, you know, being a, a person of the plant, like I like to say, um, and a consumer and advocate of cannabis, it's it's something that gives me balance in my life, right? And and when we think about cannabis and the various cannabinoids found in the plant and how those biologically marry to our endocannabinoid system, which regulates homostasis in our body, it, it makes sense. It is a balance. It is a part of our well-being, whether you're using CBD for recovery or THC for relaxation or creativity, right? There's a number of different use cases, but in the end, it's just to have a better quality of life. Oh, so beautifully said. And, and we really do embrace science and nature here at CV Sciences. We are a publicly traded life science company, one of the first publicly traded CBD companies. And I always use the word luck because we were very lucky to be early in the conversation, not as early as the cannabis experts, but early in the wellness movement. I come from, we come from the dietary supplement space many of us here at CV Sciences. So we were very lucky 10 years ago to be at the beginning of the interface between natural products and the plant. I grew up, Kevin, in a health food store. I ran a juice bar. And I will tell you from firsthand experience that almost everyone I know that's worked in a health food store, and let me just speak for myself, the very first plant that told me that these plants in nature have tremendous power was cannabis. <laughs> Now, it wasn't sold outside in the health food store, nor was it sold at the juice bar, but it was used outside in the back of the store. And I since later found out that every person that I know that worked in a health food store, one way or another, was inspired by the power of cannabis and the power of hemp. And we didn't know about the endocannabinoid system then, but we do now. And that was where I feel I was so lucky, Kevin, and CB Sciences was lucky to have friends in the science community because the first time I ever heard the term endocannabinoid tone, it was when I was working for Nordic Naturals, teaching people about omega-3. I'll never forget it, Kevin. It was 2012. Mm -hmm. I received a little, bing, you have mail. <laughs> There's a paper in my inbox. And I'm struggling for the title right now, so I'll just loosely translate it. It basically said, we fed soybean oil to animals 
and it gave them the munchies. <laughs> no, seriously. And we were studying with omega-3 how the soybean oil, right? Omega-6. Right. And Pam and Spam and Ding Dongs and Chicken Nuggets and Ho-Ho's <laughs> and Krispy Kremes kept going up and omega-3 levels were going down. And what the researchers found out, and they were at the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism uh -huh. at the NIH. This is central, grand central for endocannabinoid research. So the psychiatrist, Joe Hiblin, Dr. Hiblin sends me this paper that excessive omega-6 intake elevates endocannabinoids and induces obesity. Wow. Something to, I can't stop eating these French fries. Now, what was cool about that for me, Kevin, I was so deep in icosanoids, which is how the omega-3s and the omega-6s work. Uh -huh. So I was into the icosanoid pathway. I was not studying cannabis. I was not using the plant at the time, and I was very focused in a different direction. So that's why I say that I was lucky, we were lucky, to learn about the endocannabinoid system first 10 years ago, and then the coincidence of how certain plants and certain cannabinoids and other compounds interact with the endocannabinoid system. We believe that that gave us an advantage in helping people to demystify and understand the endocannabinoid system. So that was a serendipitous moment for both you and the company. You're saying you were at an event, there was the alcohol abuse event, right? Um, what was it, the NI? It's actually the division, it's NIAAA, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in their department of the Membrane Biophysiology Department, I correct, if I get that wrong, I'm sorry, but it's Joe Hiblin's department there. And he's a psychiatrist studying omega-3 levels and mental health. Right. And to study omega-3, you have to study omega-6. And omega-6 is is what is in, you mentioned, the, the fatty foods, like the chicken nuggets and the things like that. So as more people intake the omega-6, it, it increases obesity within their endocannabinoid system because it lowers the levels of omega-3? Well, it increases food-seeking behavior because too much omega-6 elevates the endocannabinoid activity. Now, gotcha. I'm going to be very specific and try not to overcomplicate this, but your body makes the endocannabinoids from omega-6. Okay. They're primarily, now they're also made- Naturally, from naturally they make Naturally. It. Right. So, so when you're overdoing it is what hurts us. Well, if you overdo the endocannabinoid that speaks to the CB1 receptor and it initiates food seeking behavior, can you see that if you were eating too many omega sixes that were tricking your body into the munchies, right? That you might accidentally, because of the food seeking behavior, eat your way into obesity? Wow. And, you know, just to play on that, right, is how amazing the plant is because of the various cannabinoids that are found in it. Because I just had a guest on recently, the CEO of Front Range Biosciences, and they released a line of THCV products, which do the exact opposite of what you're saying. And that's why, Kevin, anytime we hear somebody oversimplify the system, we take a deep breath. <laughs> We really do, because this is so bleeding edge. This is so exciting. We have so much to learn. So one of our mantras here at CB Sciences is don't say stupid shit. <laughs> we, we used to have these little plaques all over the office that said it. And you know, now a lot of people maybe think it's inappropriate and you know, we wouldn't really use that crude language anymore. But there was so much excitement from the cannabis community. And then there was excitement from the dietary supplement world mm -hmm. that was trying to tell everybody what they could and could not do. And here at CV Sciences, we embrace responsible use. And that's really the main word that's always on our mind, responsible use. What is the responsible use of a particular product based on its the safety and then based on the regulatory environment? Mm -hmm. So like, for example, in this country, drug has a very specific definition. And we were talking before we went live about the, the pharmaceutical CBD. And for the history of this company, Kevin, we never, ever, ever encouraged anyone to use our products or non-FDA approved products for epilepsy. I know that's controversial because a lot of parents made the decisions that they needed to make then. And now we have an FDA approved 
CBD for epilepsy but with you insurance reimbursement. You guys did that because you didn't want to put out any, I don't want to say false claims, but claims that cannot be substantiated due to the federal regulation and kind of the, the challenges we have when it comes to peer research studies and, and actually, you know, studies that have been published, right? Yes, and and if you really look at the proposed mechanism of action of CBD on top of standard of care, and you've heard about how CBD has these interactions in the liver, mm -hmm. if you get to the anti-epileptic dose of CBD, then the standard of care drugs are amplified. Right. So what, what's actually happening is the effect of CBD on the liver that's causing the drug to drug interaction is actually causing the reduction in seizures. Now this is still being debated, but there's a perfect example of where under the care of a doctor being monitored, that drug to drug interaction is the actual answer to the treatment resistant epilepsy. That's not something someone should ever be doing at home. Right. Now that they have an option in our opinion. Right. You know what, and you bring up, this brings up such a great and fascinating topic to get to dive into and that is responsible use right and you know because you got two sides of that coin you have the adult use side where you know just like alcohol well i don't like to compare cannabis to alcohol but you know if we're going to regulate it the same you have to be 21 it's an external substance right so you should um just like with alcohol be responsible in how you consume it what you're doing after if you're driving all that kind of stuff right but then that conversation gets really really complex and even more important when you think about cannabis use on the pharmaceutical and medical side right because as you've pointed out and as of other guests have pointed out on my show like len may from endo uh, canna health is that dosing and our own genetic makeup is so important as it relates and interacts to these cannabinoids, right? Because one person could be THC sensitive. One could, um, you know, respond differently with CBD as opposed to another person and dosing matters, how much you're, you're, you're intaking, right? So talk a little more about, you know, irresponsible use and proper dosing as it specifically relates to the pharmaceutical medical side of things. Okay, I'm gonna break it up into two different areas. And first I wanna talk about the dietary supplement side. Okay. And where we really see the future puck moving, and that is in this uh, cannabinoid wellness space. Okay. And that's where we're going to have the true interface of the dietary supplements and the dietary supplement regulations, and then the cannabinoid and cannabis schemes. So somewhere between those two is gonna be the future hybrid market. And I think we can all see that. And so when I say responsible use, we all believe that this plant is magic. Most people that I talk to believe that this plant is safe. And at the same time, if you use those words and you don't have the data to support that, that's where you lose credibility with regulators. Right. And so consistency and lending consistency to a product that doesn't isn't really known for consistency. Those two things, that's part of responsible use. So one of the things CB Sciences did very early on in 2014 is we began the process of taking our product and determining that it was generally recognized as safe, what's called self-affirmation. Now this generally recognized as safe self-affirmation is a very expensive and laborious way for a manufacturer to at least demonstrate to regulators that the ingredient is safe for the intended use. And because the dietary supplement world has become so big and it's a multi-billion dollar industry, they've been regulating it. And they've come up with this regulation that if you have a relatively new ingredient like hemp extract, you can't just declare it safe, you have to prove that it's safe. And the way that you prove that it's safe is there are a series of these toxicological studies. And first you're starting in little Petri dishes and then you've got to deal with animals and sperm motility. And you've just got to look at the tissues and see what happens over time. And then you publish this data. And the thing that you're looking for is called the NOEL, no observed adverse effect level. And so we published our NOEL, Kevin, years ago. And, and the mm -hmm. entire industry was, was a little, little confused. Like, this isn't even a lawful ingredient yet. 
why, why are you trying to prove it's toxic? Because if you actually look at the development of any drug and any dietary supplement, you have to prove and establish the toxicological safety of the article of commerce first before you start efficacy. Now, we were very lucky this moved quickly. Mm -hmm. Part of the responsible use for us after we established the Noel was then you take those results once they're published and you show them to four experts qualified by training. And these are the people, Kevin, that helped to introduce new ingredients into the food supply. Mm -hmm. These aren't just random people. If you know something like CoQ10, coenzyme Q10, the same people that help to look at the safety data and say, that's okay as a dietary supplement because what you're doing is putting it in the food supply. So if you list it like we do on our bottle that says dietary supplement, when we were doing that back in 2015, 2016, and everyone said, that can't be a dietary supplement. CBD is not allowed to be a dietary supplement. They're right, CBD was not. Hemp extract was a different story. So we established the Noel, then the toxicologists look at the data, then they sign off on it. Once all of that happens, then you get your document after you tell the authorities which foods you're planning on putting this hemp extract in, and then they kind of calculate the total exposure for the human. Do you hear how com complex this is? It's a very long, labor laborious process of determining that your product is generally recognized as safe for the intended use signed off by experts. To date, Kevin, no other hemp CBD company has done it. So now, another company has published some tox work, but I've not seen a full grass self-affirmation like we've done. So I understand the very conservative people that say there's not enough safety science. I mean, you saw that thing that came out the other day from uh, Valid Care that big safety thing. I see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was missing the hand that's up. No, you're good. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Let's... I thought I thought Monty was waving. No, <laughs> going by. Stuart, you're good. No, no, no. Well, let's let's jump into that that um, that article that news you mentioned. But to back up, I want to ask you. So this grass, this generally recognized as safe um, self. What is it? What'd you call self affirmation? It? Self affirmation process that you've went through, which is very you know, extensive and it, and it really shows that you're producing a product that fits the criteria of something that would be labeled as a dietary supplement. Right. And, and when you mentioned that when people said in the past that CBD cannot be listed as a dietary supplement, that's, that was my first initial reaction, right. was, but it sounds like what, what y'all have done and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, cause I have seen products that say hemp oil extract on them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just a way for them to get around some regulation because ultimately it's probably primarily CBD oil with other, you know, secondary compounds within it that makes it full spectrum oil. Is that what you all are producing or is it something other than that? And, and am I wrong with this labeling kind of loophole? Okay. So to answer your question, yes, many people decided just to call it hemp oil so that they didn't put CBD right on the front of the label. Right. We called it plus CBD starting in 2014. We put the total amount of hemp extract, biomass, mm -hmm. and then right below it, we put in parentheses, how many milligrams of CBD. So based on the American Herbal Products Association, and we had this, this big meeting, the, we, we agreed that the people that had fought for hemp for so many years, like David Bronner and uh, the other hemp people like Eric Seenstra and all of the people that had fought for hemp, they didn't want us uh, doing a wink and a nudge and saying, yeah, just call it hemp oil and put the CBD in there and she'll never know the why, she'll never be the wiser. <laughs> well, come on. Like the responsible use is not that. The FDA, was very aware that people were doing that. I'm sure you can understand why that would make them upset and angry. Right. So, so it's not a game. So, so what did y'all do? So what, what exactly, like, how is it different then than regular CBD oil or? Well, this, that's where this conversation is really worth having. Well, all, all we did, and we believe our process is a little different, but at the end of the day, let's face it, we're still talking about hemp extracts. Mm-hmm. 
And when you say hemp extracts, we then need to define what's in that particular hemp extract. And so the reason why you have to produce the safety work on the finished branded extract that you're using so that you're using the same material that you're putting out into the marketplace. So what we did was we took the process that's laid out. We were growing our hemp at the time. It was food fiber agricultural hemp, Fedora and Futura. If you're familiar with those chemovars, mm -hmm. those are the low CBD uh, and low THC food fiber hemps that are approved in Europe. And the seeds are stable. And we were able to take the top part of that plant and CO2 extract it. And unlike some of our competitors that were only focused on the major and minor cannabinoids, our product was rich in all of the fatty acids because we weren't just using the feminized flowers. We weren't roguing the males. We were using the entire harvest. Got you. You see how cool this is, Kevin? Mm -hmm. So that's why our understanding of lipids and fats and fatty acids really made a huge difference because the matrix of our product was truly filled with everything in the plant. So when I look at a certificate of analysis and I see just cannabinoids and terpenes and terpenoids, and there's no fatty acids and none of the other compounds that are in the plant, you know, let's not get into an argument, but we can say that our products are super full spectrum. How's that? Right. <laughs> and it sounds like it. Now that you explain it that way, it's like, <laughs> like it's like you said, it's not just the concentrated oil from the, the, the bud of the flower or the male, you know, uh, aspect of the, it's it's everything it's the entire plant which <laughs> super super full spectrum is exactly the right word for it right so i would imagine in that type of formulation in that product there's much more medicinal therapeutic benefits as just a regular full spectrum uh, product that has secondary compounds right? now this is where i hopefully will gain the trust of your audience nobody knows, nobody knows the answer to that question and if I was to bank my, my opinion, and let's compare this now to fish oil, mm -hmm. and you've got cod liver oil, which is like our super full spectrum. You get it? It's mm -hmm. got all the other stuff in there. Right. Versus just concentrated EPA or DHA. Do you see the analogy? Mm -hmm. I would bet that it's the exact milligram amount of the fatty acids that are needed in clinical medicine when you're making a drug for a disease, which is different than wellness and well being and keeping yourself healthy by eating fish and fish oil. Right. You see the difference? It does. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying basically is that you need this. This substance, we'll call it in, inherently in your body anyway, for that homeostasis effect with your endocannabinoid system. But what y'all are doing is is more of a level of the therapeutic and pharmaceutical side that you'd need for medicinal purposes. But that's only on our drug side, Kevin. That's why this is such a nuanced conversation. Right. When it comes to just the natural product side and the wellness side, for example, we have a five milligram soft gel, uh, one of our raw products. The soft gel only contains five milligrams of CBD and most of it's CBDA. What's the other matrix? It's all that other 499 compounds in the hemp plant. Which include terpenes, flavonoids, um, I mean everything. Grosamide, the fatty acids, there are compounds yeah. in there and we've looked at them through GC mass spec, I know others have. And that's why I wanted to get in the eyes and in the minds of cannabis lovers. Right. The idea, what if you kept all the seeds in there and you had all the fatty acids and the grossamide that's in the shell of the seed, and to your point, the flavonoids and the other compounds, all of that together, do we know for sure that that's better than isolated CBD? Well, it would depend on the indication. If it was my child and they had epilepsy, right, right. I'd be using the Epidiolex product today if we had insurance and we could get insurance reimbursement for it. Mm -hmm. You see how nuanced that is? So that's when we say responsible use, we know that there is that recreational market that's kind mm -hmm. of just, that's always there. But the future market is that wellness space that's responsible, that's defined, where everything is consistent, lot coded, and trustworthy. Uh, to that point, Kevin, after we published that safety work that we did, we then started to do some uh, preclinical work. We did some open label pilot trials, giving our finished product 
and we publish those papers on PubMed, we publish the largest case series for anxiety on a hemp extract yet published, about 100 people. And they got results with 25 milligrams a day. This is, just gets right to your point of our, uh, one of our full spectrum extracts. Mm-hmm. Kevin, you've probably looked at the literature and for anxiety, you've seen on the isolated CBD that they're saying 300 milligrams might be the appropriate dose. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Yep. You see how hard that is for people to get their head around? How yeah. could 25 milligrams of a full spectrum product get similar results to 300 milligrams of just the CBD? And then how many more studies do we need to conduct between now and then to truly truly tease out what is the signal to noise ratio? And that's why we always go back to responsible use and we try to prevent ourselves from saying one thing is better than another because there's a lot of placebo effect here Mm -hmm. and a lot of bias we bring to the conversation. Definitely a lot of placebo um, due to the fact that the market's saturated, right? With that, with the lack of regulation from the FDA or even enforcement in some areas, it's just kind of the wild, wild west. And there's people that don't know what they're consuming. They don't know if it's low quality, if there's even any cannabinoids or those secondary compounds at all, right? And, and what you guys are doing at CV Sciences is so forward thinking when you talk about the future of therapeutics and the future of medicine, right? But, and I've talked about this with other experts on the podcast and, and my always my go back to, I'm just fascinated by how there's operators like, like you and CV Sciences that are so ahead of the game when it comes to thinking about um, responsible use, like you've said, and, and how our bodies interact with these cannabinoids and what actually is working and what's not and the efficacy around them. And then you have the healthcare system and our universities and colleges where there's little to no conversation of our endocannabinoid system at all, right? So you've got like the industry at full speed ahead. And then you've got the, the actual <laughs> people that implement this stuff on the way back end of the train. So my question to you, Stuart, is how do we start to educate these people more? I know that y'all are doing studies and whatnot, which is great, but like, what can the industry do as a whole? Well, thank you very much for asking me. I'm going to share my personal opinion first because I'm very biased about this. I think it has to do with education. And I know it's easy to say, but we now have access to supercomputers 24 hours a day. There are thousands of podcasts, there are papers being published constantly I don't think there's any more excuse to not being fully informed, fully informed about the limitations and the regulations. I mean, we can say all that we want about it's not fair that you can't put a claim right on the product. If you look at our packaging, we don't have any claims anywhere of any kind. Let's say that you're allowed to get the claim, the exciting claim that everybody wants. I worked Mm -hmm. in the omega-3 industry for 10 years. Here was the claim we had on fish oil. Supportive but not conclusive. (laughs) Supportive, but not conclusive research suggests that omega-3 EPA and DHA may reduce the risk of coronary vascular disease. Now, if you want it to say reduces coronary vascular disease death 25% on top of standard of care, they had to conduct something called the reduce it trial with 8,000 people showing that it reduced death on top of standard of care. That took like 15 years. Wow. You see, so give time, time. I listened to some of your shows getting ready to meet you, Kevin. And uh, and I was struck by the lack of patience (laughs) in so many cool young people on your show that are saying things like in one year or two years. No, 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 Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's probably not going to go down like that. So in the meantime, you you should, you should follow the Twitter feeds uh, on the financial markets and cannabis and you'll really see impatience, you know, but I've been here for seven years and we're a publicly (laughs) traded company. I've lived it. (laughs) This is the biggest, this is the biggest disruption ever. Cannabis is the most widely used illicit substance on earth. And we just need to find a way to help people responsibly use it. And when we start combining it with melatonin, when we start combining it with other things, we really need to make sure that we're playing by the rule books that are set up by regulators. That's number one. And when it comes to the messaging, the FTC, wow, 
when this thing really gets regulated, Kevin, I'm going to be looking forward to finding out what people can say about cannabis and cannabinoids. Uh, me too. You'll me have to too. focus on the endocannabinoid system and what it actually might do and then stop making uh, you know, broad sweeping statements. So I think it's going to make us better. It'll make the industry better and it will serve consumers. Mm -hmm. you, you nailed it. I hadn't heard that perspective, but it's so spot on. It's like, just to get those claims that everybody wants, you have to have time for, you know, to, to, to gather that research and, and that, you know, those studies and those trials, and it's not going to happen overnight, you know, even with, if in fact we get federal regular uh, legalization within this administration to implement that is going to take a year or two at least. Right. I mean, so we're we're in a, this is a game that's a, a marathon not a sprint and and i think that you're dead on when you talk about that kind of stuff and and you know another thing that i think about when you say the obsession with these false or these claims to put on these boxes is why like the product <laughs> speaks for itself exactly <laughs> you know like if you have a good product like from cv sciences or a company that really is focused on the science aspect and you know um like you said responsible use like the thing's going to sell, you know, like just let people try it for themselves. But the reason why that consumer adoption, I think hasn't happened so quickly is there's a couple of things. One is of course the stigma around THC and everybody kind of lumps cannabis into one bucket, THC, you get high. Right. And then the other is the, we talked about the market saturation. There's so many players and there's a lot of bad actors that you don't know what you're getting. And if people have a bad experience one time, they're not going to go back again, or it's going to be difficult to get them back, you know? Well, the only thing I'd like to add to that, Kevin, is I think that to be really fair, I mean, how many bad experiences with plant-based real cannabis do we ever really hear about? I mean, I'm not trying to say that there isn't a risk. <laughs> right. I'm saying that, you know, it's really a relatively safe compound with responsible use. We all kind of know where the, the bumpers are, but it's really a lot of the synthetic cannabinoids and this is why we really want full regulation. And we also want a registry. We want an FDA registry. A lot of people don't know that that's really what FDA is asking for, in our opinion. They want the companies to register. And that was something that a lot of dietary supplement companies, a lot of very libertarian type of people and their thinking that didn't want to be on a register. Well, Hemp is only one of the newer compounds that the FDA is aware of. The plant medicine, as all the cool kids are calling it. And they're very aware of what's going on out there. And they're going to regulate these things. And so I think the more responsible we are and the more educated we are about the process and when something becomes a drug versus when is it a dietary supplement, when is it part of wellness? For example, I've come to the conclusion and I'd love your thoughts on this, that for daily wellness, we should teach people about hemp extracts and CBD as antioxidants. 100%, yes. If you just say, don't you agree, Kevin? Is it easier yes. than, than an alternative to an opioid? 100%, absolutely. And I myself have had experience with opioids and I've had friends and that is a slippery slope, my friend. You know, if, But if even you, saying it, even though it might be, I yeah. say that's when regulators, when we say CBD can lower the amount of opioids necessary because it's a modulator of the mu opioid receptor. Uh, wow, now we're in real dangerous territory here. Uh, right. Instead of saying CBD, every day people are finding out between five to 50 milligrams of CBD daily. We've all heard about how important antioxidants are. CBD might be one of the most exciting antioxidants we've ever seen, and it can help keep healthy people healthy. And that's why, Kevin, we took this 15 milligram gold soft gel. This is the number one seller in the natural product industry. And after the safety data, we then conducted a randomized control trial. Did you know we've already conducted and published a randomized control trial on our branded product? Did you know that? I did not know that. No. And I want to take a look at it. If you, after we record, you got to send me these. I will send it to you. Now, here's what's so cool. You can't study sick people. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Let me say it again. <laughs> Ganjapreneurs out there, <laughs> you can't study sick people because it's a dietary supplement. Right. So our job, here's what FDA says, if you can make healthy people healthier, 
Now I'll say that again. It's almost impossible. Can you make healthy people healthier? Well, if, that's almost impossible. So that's why you see very little true dietary supplement research because you can't make healthy people healthier with one pill of fish oil. Fish oil might lower triglycerides, but if it's lowering triglycerides, it's acting like a drug. So you can't say that. Gosh. So, so here's what we did. You give it to the healthy people and we found people that were metabolically a little bit challenged. They were a little bit bigger on the BMI, but not fat, not overweight at all. Okay. Right. But, but they were not medicated at all. So they were not sick. So we got them right on the edge. We gave them one gold soft gel a day, only one, because that was based on the toxicology work. Mm -hmm. Our serving size is only 15 milligrams. Now we've bumped it up to 50. But at the time, we only had safety work to justify the 15 milligrams. One soft gel a day, uh, 60 people in the study, people slept better. They slept longer. They ate less. They ate less. It's the opposite of THC. CBD sends satiety signals. You're full. THC tells you to eat. CBD tells you you're full. And right. their HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, went up. They slept better. They slept longer. They ate less. Their good cholesterol went up. And, and there was no elevated liver enzymes. So like that study that came out the other day, the big valid care study that came out, you know, the reason we didn't participate in that is we've already done all that. Not only that, once we got done with the randomized control trial, we then went back, listen to this, Kevin, we went back and looked at the adverse event reporting between 2018 and 2019, mm -hmm. a 5 million bottles sold, and then peer reviewed and published those results. Of the adverse effects? Yeah, no was... adverse event. No adverse no serious effect. adverse. So we, we're already at, now we're going to do a 10 million bottle <laughs> for your stuff. So when people are saying, I want to find out if it's safe in the rat liver, I'm like, I don't know. We're already giving it to millions of people and tracking that it's safe. So, okay. To that point, what, like when you approach, or if you, I mean, I'm sure you have, you've talked to healthcare professionals, clinicians, you showed them these studies. What do they say? They love it. They're excited they, they, about it. There's no negativity. You know, especially the cool young, you know, special shout out to anyone who says anything negative about young people. Here, young pharmacists walk up to the booth. I'm standing there. In the beginning, we were the only CBD company. Now, you know, there's, you know, 3,000, right? So they okay. walk up. Why is your CBD different? I hold up the Journal of Toxicology. We established the Noel on this. You did? Yeah, yeah that's a huge did. differentiator. We did? Yeah. yeah. And then we did our RCT. You did? Yeah, randomized control trial on this. Really? And then we sold 5 million bottles. Look at it. And it's, what's the opening order discount? Like it goes from, it's a very fast sale now. So, so, but I, what my question is, so like what's outside of like the sales opportunity, they see that it works. Like, are they open to learning about this whole oh, new area of like, yeah, that's all over. Biology? Whoever said that they're not into it. I'm, I'm here to put that out completely. Whoever's saying that no one's into the cannabinoid conversation and cannabinoids like the name of your show kevin when they told me the first show that i'm going to get to be on is called cannabinoid connect <laughs> i was dancing an irish jig up and down the hallways nice. there. no one could stop me um you know what i said <laughs> vindicated do you know why i picked that name why because i wanted it front and center in the podcast title so that people are forced to educate themselves about what that is I was so, I felt so relieved. I actually told every person that I could meet, that I could talk to for the next several days about, hey, guess what? We're going to put, our first show is called Can Cannabinoid Connect. <laughs> so yeah, everyone's into this now. Whoever says that they're not into it just isn't into it yet. That's all. And as soon as they start realizing that everyone's speaking this language, I listened to some of your shows and I heard one of those commercials for a laboratory that tests all isomers of Delta 8 and Delta 9. New Bloom Labs, yep. I did another iris jig down the hallway and I said, all <laughs> isomers, there we go. And we, and I know that that's a bold statement and I actually had their head of sciences on the podcast and she explains exactly how they do it. So if anybody wants to hear that, they, they can tune in. See, now that's a great thing. When I told people small structural changes in cannabinoids confer huge outcome. If we don't make CBD correctly, it interacts with the CB1 receptor and it might get you high. And they were like, I don't know. I was like, we're going to get to the chirality sooner or later. We're going to look at the sooner. And here we are. And now we're on Cannabis Connect and you're validating it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Say full circle here, Stuart. Exactly. You know, and so when you talk about the inevitable regulation that's going to happen within the hemp space with CBD and even, you know, the THC space federally, uh, inevitably, 
what does that look like? Like, you know, I, I'm seeing, and of course, there's a lot of talk out there, right? You, you hear THC caps, you hear this, you hear that, like, from a from a adult use perspective and from a pharmaceutical medicinal perspective, tell me what we can expect from regulation. Three swim lanes. Three swim lanes. Three swim lanes and probably a big department. Oh, because the, the well-being aspect. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. You're going to have to have it. And then there's going to be some giant department of alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and cannabis. And we're going to embrace this as the multi-trillion dollar industry that it is. And then we'll finally get the food fiber hemp growing here. We got it growing in Europe. We got our clocks cleaned here, Kevin. We were banking that people would want to grow giant fiber hemp here. No way. They were much more interested in, you know, Ringo's Gift, ACDC, um, <laughs> what are Tsunami, Sue, Cherry, all those, you know, chemovars that they're growing. But sooner or later, we'll also get the giant crops over here like we have in Europe. And then we'll get the hempcrete going and we'll get the fabrics going and we'll get the plastic going. And then the thing will really get huge. And that's where CB Sciences, we began with the end in mind. That was one of the little calculation mishaps that we had early on. We thought everyone would follow the European dual cropping fiber model, right? So they could have food, fiber, replacement for plastics, but you've got to build a giant infrastructure here in America to take advantage of that. So that there's a lot coming. Right. I mean, that, and that's what fascinates me so much, man. It's like, we talked a lot about the therapeutic, uh, the wellness, the pharmaceutical and the, uh, the adult use side. Right. And you know, that really speaks to the, the consuming the plant. But then when you talk about industrial hemp and the applications and like, that's a whole other segment that, and that's why I'm just so passionate about this industry is because it can change the way in which we do everything. You know? I know it's whoever cracks that code on the plastic argument. And we've heard it for years and on the paper argument, it's going to be enormous right now. All the juice, so to speak, the squeeze is in the flower because it's a mm -hmm. pharmacy and a flower. And that's where all the interest is. But once we get enough of that and we have enough access, then all of those other secondary and tertiary products will make sense. And we believe at CV sciences that our expertise we believe that we're going to carve out in that multi-trillion dollar cannabis market, that wellness space of responsible use. See that square right there? And for those listening, he's, um, Stuart's got a paper up that just shows a circle with like a, a piece of the pie, I guess, of what you guys are yeah. targeting, right? Yeah, right in there in that wellness spot. And we're not the only ones. You've seen the, the announcements lately of other cannabis operators wanting to compete in the human wellness space. Mm -hmm. Well, we're bringing our expertise in human nutrition and human wellness from the Council of Responsible Nutrition, from the way that supplements are regulated, from the way that drugs are made, and we're bringing that expertise. So we really see that there's opportunity for everybody and that there will be a, a market that's so big that we'll be able to, uh, to help a lot of people. This is really the next wave of wealth production for the next generation. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with you. And it, and it's clear that CV sciences is well positioned to be, you know, a trailblazer when it comes to, to, to bringing that side of the expertise to the conversation, you know, um, well, one thing I want to share with you before I run out of time here, if you don't mind, this is sure. a little, this is a little note that I made when I started years ago. I don't even think Monty's even seen this or, or Melissa, but it just, it's a little thing that says seed extraction, safety, efficacy, and then service. And I, I look at this all the time because it's now seven years later. In the beginning, everyone was arguing about the seeds. And then the argument was about extraction, right? Is CO2 better than this? Is better than that, right? And then everyone was arguing about safety. It's safe, it's safe, it's safe. But once you publish the toxicological safety of it, uh, and getting back to one of your questions, you know, then they'll decide how they can limit which cannabinoids based on the safety. The next stage is efficacy. Well, efficacy is a long process that people are proving. Where are we today? We're in the service business. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing about CD Sciences that I really love. We put the customers first. We always put the customer first. This is about the customer. So we wanted to make a product that would meet the customer where they needed to be met. That's why when you pick up a bottle of plus CBD, it looks like something you're familiar with. Right. And then when they do the research and find out that we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, I mean, we didn't get any credit. That's not fair. We got very little credit, Kevin, for doing everything right while a lot of our competitors are not. And I believe at the end of the day, because of education, because of access to information, and because of the interweb, 
that you're much better off to have done it the way that CV Sciences has done it than to make claims that you can't substantiate and that you'll later regret. I totally agree. And it's inevitable that's coming, regulations coming. And those competitors that chose to go a different path and maybe act, you know, more, um, just non-moral, you know, unmorally than immorally, they're, they're going to, they're going to be weeded out. You know, the, we're going to see the kind of the dust settle once regulation comes. And again, CV sciences will be well positioned for that. Stuart, you mentioned that CV sciences is a publicly traded company. So tell us what the plans are for the company in 2021 and beyond. Okay. Well, right now we are taking advantage of the uh, first mover advantage that we believe that we've had, an early mover advantage. We're already on shelves of close to 8,000 stores. Wow. And the relationship that we've built with these stores, because of the level of expertise and service, we've got deep roots in those stores. Because at the end of the day, once you get through that list of seed extraction, safety, efficacy, it's all about service. Mm -hmm. So we've just finished a rebrand. We've only gone through one rebrand, unlike some other companies that tried to change it up many times. So the rest of this year, all of our new products are filling out on all of the store shelves. We've also launched our professional line called Pro CBD. We always sold special products to the professional community, meaning doctors and pharmacists. But that's a huge initiative for us because, Kevin, they're so open to the science. They're so aware of how competitive the field is and we have a competitive advantage with doctors and with pharmacists. And we are also keeping our eye on the greater cannabinoid wellness space. So the CEO of our company, Joe Dowling mentioned on our most recent earning call that that's something that CB Sciences is looking at. So that's something that I'm allowed to say that we're looking at the broader cannabinoid space as we expand and we're very bullish on our drug development program. We have a program where we're combining nicotine and CBD for smokeless tobacco addiction. And we've got the patent for that. And we've been granted the patent in Japan as well. So building out our pharma side, uh, that's an aspiration for the company, working more closely with doctors and healthcare providers. That's a big initiative. And then also we have some new structure function products coming and a whole pipeline of new products in the dietary supplement space. We will be busy on all fronts. And finally, we also launched a 0.00 THC product line called Happy Lane. And that is uh, primarily for convenience stores, but we're finding out, Kevin, and you might've had this experience too, that for any lover of the plant who uses cannabis at all, if you eat 0.00 THC, you know, gummies or products during the day, mm -hmm. it can be great to obliterate daytime sleepiness. It's almost like executive function. Have you noticed this? Pure CBD, Ethan Rousseau says CBD can elevate have you ever heard him, him say this? I, I know who Ethan, I'm familiar with Ethan Russo, Dr. Ethan Russo, but no, I haven't heard this, but he's saying. He no. says CBD <laughs> can elevate, THC can sedate. So the reason people are confused is when they look at hemp extracts and say, but that calms me down or makes me a little sleepy. When you have 0.00 THC and it's pretty much pure CBD, that's where Dr. Russo says, I wish people would stop saying CBD makes you sleepy because it elevates now, if you can reduce daytime sleepiness during the day, that's the ideal way to get a good night's sleep. Right. The best right. way to get a good night's sleep. Right, because you're working all day and you're tired at the end of the day and you want to go to bed. <laughs> you're not. And that's a healthier circadian rhythm instead of taking 20 milligrams of THC to knock yourself out before you go to bed. So right. like responsible use, getting back to our thesis here, mm -hmm. whether it's in the convenience store, whether it's in the health food store, and whether it's in the doctor's office or whether it's a prescription product, we bring that to all of these different divisions. Yeah, it sounds like you're really, I mean, because the plant can touch so many de demographics, like we talked about, any kind of age, right? I mean, obviously you need to be above 21 or older, but race, you know, wherever you live, whatever, however you want to consume it, formulations, it touches us in different ways. So the fact that CV Sciences is really thinking about that and planning their product lines to um, correspond to those different uh, target markets is, is huge, man. Like I said, you guys are really well positioned. Um, not, not just now, but of course for the future, be, you know, because you are such a forward thinking company. 
So Stuart, I want to give you the floor before we wrap up. Uh, what do you want to leave the audience with um, final words? I'd like you to go to our YouTube page, CV Sciences on YouTube. And we've produced some of the most exciting original content. I'm biased, but there's one webinar called uh, Terpenes and Terpenoids with Dr. Jamie Caroon that's in the algorithm for Google. And it is so good. And there's a minute with Miles and the new videos from Maggie Frank, our national educator and spokesperson. And so please check us out, YouTube CV Sciences. And when you think of plus CBD and CV Sciences, think of responsible use. Our ticker is CVSI, Charlie, Victor, Sam, Ida. Check us out. Responsible use, the thesis of today's episode with Mr. Stuart Tomp. VP of Human Nutrition at CV Sciences. Man, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and the insights. I know I got a lot out of it and I know the audience did as well. Thank you, Kevin. It was truly a pleasure. Awesome. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye.